Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Now today, I'm really excited to be speaking with senior lecturer, Dr. Emma Mosley. Emma, great to have you on. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. I'm honoured and delighted. Uh, Let's start where we always start. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So yeah, I'm uh, a senior lecturer in sports psychology at Solent University. I'm also a BASIS accredited sports scientist specialising in sports psychology Um, but kind of throughout my career I'm now maybe more towards the end of a a psychophysiologist uh, and a researcher within that area than than perhaps uh, you know just specializing in in sports psychology Um, and I think that's definitely come from when I was an undergraduate I really liked both psychology and physiology and I was so lucky to do um a research assistant placement with Martin Turner and Mark Jones um, yeah. with all the challenge and threat stuff. And uh, I kind of got exposed to it that way. And, and that's really kind of shaped my, my journey from there. I love it. Well, we, I don't know if you know this, but we've had, we, we haven't had the, uh, the godfather of challenge state himself, professor Mark Jones on yet. Um, but uh, we've had Martin on obviously to talk a little bit more about um, REBT, but we've had uh, Jamie Barker and we've had Carla Mayen. So we've had plenty of conversation about challenge. I love challenge and threat state. And I, I'm, ass- I'm assuming you're a big fan yourself. Yeah, of course. Um, something that it was uh, amazing to be exposed to when I was an undergraduate, literally just working at, as a research assistant. Yeah. Um, I kind of like delved off into into heart rate variability because that's just where my my path took me. But um, yeah, of course, it's a it's a super fascinating uh, research area. And that's what we're going to be talking about today: heart rate variability. We're going to be uh, psychophysiologists for the next hour or so, which is awesome because we haven't really delved into that side of things on the sports that show too much other than briefly when we talked about challenge and threat but uh, I mean uh, I'm curious uh, as you describe yourself as a psychophysiologist now I suppose but um, you got into sports psychology I mean why sports psychology how did that start for you that that interest in this area so for me I, I've always been interested in, in sport um, I'm quite a sporty person um, and I, I was always interested in sport and um, actually the the mind itself in sport and I think that's that's probably why we're all in this field um but particularly I was really interested in how perhaps our perceptions of the environment can actually change our physiological response um and that for me is something that is particularly fascinating how these kind of two entities link together because Mm. they're not uh sole uh, elements of our body working independently they they very much work together um to create these sensations that we might feel directly before competition so you know somatic anxiety for example um you know that that's a really lovely example of how the mind and body are working together to create a reaction to to the environment i talk to coaches a lot about biopsychosocial and the interaction between a human being's biology their psychology and their social environment. You're throwing in another word there, physiology. Um, is there biology, physiology, is there a difference? Is it, is it the same? Is it, it, tell me, Emma. I mean, I don't know whether I can give you an academic uh, definition, no, uh, but in terms of, I would kind of picture biology as um, the more kind of anatomy side of things. So actually like those elements that, that are within our body mm. and physiology is those um, when they're actually um, creating some sort of response to uh, the environment itself. Uh, again, you know, I'm not a biologist. I'm certainly not a physiologist. So I, I can imagine physiologists are probably cringing at that. At my, uh, <laughs> no, 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 there. no. Actually, it's given me a good picture of it. So, so I'm thinking. I mean, you describe yourself as a psychophysiologist. So, I'm thinking of um, uh, utilizing uh, our, our psychology, psychological tools, psychological processes to impact uh, our, our physiology, um, and that's changing biological markers, I suppose. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that 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 sort of evokes a a, a good picture for me. Um, okay, so heart rate variability. So you've co-written a paper with Sylvain Laborde, uh, a scoping review of heart rate variability in sport and exercise psychology. So I, I think a good place to start here is is actually defining what heart rate variability is um, and then telling us a little bit about this project and telling us what a scoping review actually is. I can, I can, I can hazard a guess. Uh, but why don't you tell us, uh, why don't you define heart rate variability for us? Why don't you talk to us a little bit about the genesis of this paper and, and, and tell us what a scoping review is? Yeah, so heart rate variability is essentially the, the time interval between our heartbeats. Um, so in essence, it's a reasonably simple measure. Um, and what really it's reflecting is the activity of the autonomic nervous system. Um, and I'm sure you're aware and lots of listeners are aware as well. But just to recap, if people don't know, the autonomic nervous system is made up of two branches, the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. So sympathetic side speeds everything up. It's a side that's associated with fight or flight. Um, and then we have the parasympathetic system that is essentially this kind of rest, relax, recovery um, arm of the autonomic nervous system. Now, why we're particularly interested in those is they actually control the variation in our heartbeat. Um, and that's why we're particularly interested in this from a psychological point of view, because the autonomic nervous system basically tells us how someone is adapting to the environmental demand. So hence, that's why we're, we're interested in this. Um, but the very interesting part which is sometimes overlooked um, is that actually we're more interested in the parasympathetic side quite simply this is because the the parasympathetic influence over the heart is much much faster than the sympathetic side um, and this is because it's controlled by uh, the vagus nerve which is which is a cranial nerve so this basically means that the parasympathetic system has far greater um, and faster control over our heartbeats um, and the change in between those than the sympathetic side. So that's why you might often see heart rate variability termed as cardiac vagal activity, vagal tone, um, because the vagus nerve is very much in control of how our heart changes to um, the demands in the environment. Um, I know that's probably quite a long-winded way of, of talking about what heart rate variability is, but I think it's it's quite important to kind of give this idea of, you know, where it comes from and actually the element of the autonomic nervous system that we're actually interested in. And so tell us a little bit about this study. So in terms of this study, it's actually something that I wish I'd started when I started my PhD. Um, okay. Because... There wasn't anything like this when I started. There was very limited literature around how we use heart rate variability in sport and exercise psychology. There'd been a reasonable amount done in it, but actually there wasn't actually uh, any kind of holistic overview. Um, as we kind of move through the literature and you read more and you become more aware of the methodology that you have to use to get good heart rate variability data, it kind of became apparent that there's a lot of stuff out there that perhaps doesn't actually reflect what heart rate variability is. Um, so the reason that we wanted to do this, particularly in sport and exercise psychology, is heart rate variability is super popular and it's growing and you can measure it using your iPhone apparently you can measure it using polar heart rate monitors garmin um all these things you know that are readily available on the market so you've also got yep. the aura ring the whoop system all these sorts of things so that are measuring or allegedly measuring heart rate variability so i think with this kind of huge growth and interest particularly in sport and exercise psychology it was very apparent that we needed to kind of showcase how we can use heart rate variability effectively and actually how it's been used already. So heart rate variability essentially represents the change in the time intervals between heartbeats, between adjacent heartbeats. Yeah. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, spot on. So, so, so what is having good heart rate variability 
is it having consistency or inconsistency? So this is a really good question because I think sometimes people get a little bit confused around, oh, do I want high or low heart rate variability? What what does that yeah. mean? So um, just to give you a bit of an example, if we take something like heart rate and yes. we think about our heart rate beating at 60 beats per minute, um, our heart doesn't beat at every single second of that minute. It's constantly changing. Now, we want a variable heart rate because when we are faced with a demand in our environment, say you're going to cross the road and a car's coming, you want your system to be able to react really quickly and effectively to shorten those um, intervals in between those heartbeats, increase heart rate and get you out of the way of danger. So obviously that's very much that kind of inbuilt response that we have. Um, But actually we want high heart rate variability we want us to be able to adapt in these particular situations and like i was talking about earlier it's actually the parasympathetic system that that is in control of this because it has this kind of um breaking system on the heart if you like so am i am i getting this correct that let's let's take your example of heart rate and 60 beats per minute it's not so much a consistent rhythm of one two three 60 beats per minute being ideally you know one one beat per per second Mm -hmm. it's for example one two three four five six four seven eight it's kind of it's there's a lot of variability there absolutely yeah so the time changes are are variable and they they should be variable and that variability allows us to be attuned on you know we've got a nervous system that is attuned to our environment and so that variability is in place in order for us to act robustly in our environment depending on the threats that we're potentially threats and rewards that we're experiencing at any given time absolutely and it allows us to regulate ourselves in those situations So what you commonly see is heart rate variability referred to as a measure of self-regulation. So actually, how able are we to cope with the demands of our situation um, and actually regulate our kind of behaviours in in those environments? So we're measuring our heart rate variability to uh, discover how variable we want a high variability of our heart rate. What if we discover... A, I mean, we'll talk about what relationship heart rate variability has with certain psychological concepts, for example, certain behavioral um, indices. But um, if I have a low heart rate variability, I mean, should I be worried? Should I be nervous? If, if, if that heart rate, is, heart rate variability is fairly consistent, what does that mean? Um, so obviously, you know, I'm I'm not a clinical no. expert by any means. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to be diagnosing you to go to your doctors or anything like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but essentially what that means is uh, we're maybe under a state of stress for a period of time. Um, we have more demands on our system um, that, than usual. So it might be that for example, you have had a period of illness or you've had a period of heavy training or overtraining. Um, you might have had a period of stress. So, for example, exams uh, for a student athlete prior to a, an important competition. So actually, our system might um, be quite tired in a sense. So actually, our resources are not necessarily available. Um, and that's what we might kind of see as a you could call it a low heart rate variability, but we would almost call it like low parasympathetic activity. And it's almost like that opposite to being rested and relaxed and ready for whatever the environment throws at us. Actually, if we've had multiple stresses over a longer period of time, we're more likely to see this this lower parasympathetic activity, which means we're perhaps not best adapt to kind of cope with the demands of our environment. That's really interesting. So first and foremost, it's an indicator of well-being? Yeah, so it's an indicator of well-being, health and self-regulation. Um, so it does have kind of like global constructs to this. So it is used in a clinical setting. It is used in like the training sciences and things like that. Um, and I think, again, that almost bleeds into this issue of heart rate variability can be used for everything um, when actually it can't and it does obviously need a lot of interpretation behind the measures that we're taking 
Okay, so well-being, health, and self-regulation. Is there a relationship with performance at all? If I if I have a, a, a heavily variable heart rate, is that an indicator that that might be have a or might that have a link to high performance? Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting question. So I would say performance to an extent, yes. Um, and there is some evidence to suggest that um, interventions like heart rate variability biofeedback can help to improve elements of sporting performance. Yeah. But I do think we have to be careful uh, because I don't necessarily think the evidence is quite there yet to say, yes, high levels of heart rate variability equals better performance. What I would say is that high heart rate variability might help us to kind of indicate an optimal performance state. So when we're perhaps most ready for performance, or perhaps, um, you know, we're, we're in the best state psychologically and physiologically. Um, but it could also be um, a little bit more of a complex process. So for example, if we have higher heart rate variability, it might mean that we have better self regulation in a competitive environment. So it might not necessarily be the heart rate variability that, that is the determinant of performance, it might be actually that we are better able to access coping resources in a demanding situation because we have um, that kind of uh, better state to allow us to do that. Um, but again, I, I wouldn't say that that's a, a definite yes for performance. I definitely think that there's links, but I think that, that more needs to be done in terms of the research to, to give you a definite answer on that. And so in terms of this, was, was that what this scoping review was all about to really discover what historically previous research had discovered with relation to well-being, health and performance? Yeah, so actually, we, we really were interested in how has heart rate variability been used and applied in sport and exercise psychology. Okay. Um, performance wasn't necessarily one of those things, okay. purely because that's not necessarily a psychological measure there might have been links to performance but obviously we were more interested in the topics that it had been applied to um and i think that in itself leads quite nicely to well where do we go from here what are the recommendations for future practice uh, and what do we know already well before we unpack what you discovered i mean i suppose the natural next question is well um if i want to work on my heart rate variability what, what can I do? Uh, what intervention or interventions are there? Yeah, so, I mean, quite simply, slow-paced breathing is going to be your go-to for yep. improving heart rate variability. So specifically improving parasympathetic activity or vagal-mediated heart rate variability, cardiac vagal activity, all of the kind of scientific terms that go along with that. Um, and this is because by slowing our breathing down, it directly innovates the, the vagus nerve, which is great news for heart rate variability because it means that we, we get an increase in that, which is obviously really beneficial. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into the, the nuts and bolts of how we go about doing that. Yeah, if that's OK with you. If you want to yeah, you, of brilliant. course. Um, so typically when we're looking at a slow paced breathing intervention, you might have seen this kind of presented as heart rate variability biofeedback as well. Um, and that's quite commonly used. Um, from kind of recent research, we found that actually there's not a huge difference between heart rate variability biofeedback and slow paced breathing uh, on heart rate variability itself. Essentially, what this means is slow paced breathing is the mechanism that you're using. Um, you don't necessarily need a screen in front of you to get the same results, which actually is fantastic in terms of applied practice because we can do it outside of the lab. We can do it, uh, you know, in the sporting setting, which means that um, it's super accessible to be able to improve heart rate variability. And, and so sorry to interject, Emma, there, just for everybody listening, when you say biofeedback, what you're essentially saying is that slow paced breathing with something in front of you that's giving you some kind of data, some measurement back. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you typically you will um, see your kind of physiological information on the screen as you're doing a, a breathing exercise, for example. It, it doesn't have to just be heart rate variability. It can be used with with lots of other with other markers as well. But typically, that's the one that that's used the most often. So that's really interesting. So what you're basically saying is that slow uh, slow paced breathing. You can utilize that in any setting. You don't need this screen. You don't need this data being thrown back. Um, visually to be able to utilize HRV uh, training effectively. Yeah, essentially, heart rate variability biofeedback definitely has a place in applied practice. Athletes really like to see stuff and actually have that kind of physical evidence. But actually, the mechanism that is increasing um, parasympathetic activity is the slow-paced breathing. And that's because we're we're coupling um, respiration and heart rate um, to the, the same resonance, if you like. And this is is actually quite simple to do. Um, you just have to breathe around six cycles per minute. Um, so for those of you that don't know, normal breathing cycle is around 12 to 20. So it's kind of halving our normal breathing rate. So it is actually quite a lot slower than we're perhaps aware of when we're breathing day to day. Mm. Um, mm. And Again, really accessible for athletes, coaches. There's lots of apps that you can do this on um, in terms of um, like free apps on you know iOS, whatever. Um, yep. So actually, it's a really quick and easy way to be able to improve heart rate variability just by breathing at six cycles per minute. Wow, that's really simple. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of uh, really getting the best out of those six cycles per minute, you want to kind of be inhaling for around 4.5 seconds and exhaling for around 5.5 seconds. So exhalation should be a little bit longer um, just because that helps to really improve that parasympathetic activity. So it's not five and five then, which I've been told told before. It's slightly a slight adjustment from that. So evidence suggests that a slightly longer exhale um, actually gives us higher levels of parasympathetic activity. However, as long as it's around this six cycles per minute, um, that is essentially what what we're going for. Um, I think something else to consider as well, particularly when you're working with athletes, coaches, is kind of comfort as well, because um, that's something that's really important. If you're breathing at a rate that's actually not very comfortable for you in the first instance, your adherence to that is probably going to be quite low. Um, so actually, if I was doing this with an athlete, I often kind of ask about like subjective comfort as well. So how comfortable did you find that? And then obviously, potentially getting the breathing slower at a later date. Um, so there's, there's definitely an element of training that, that might go with this. But in terms of what we see in research, as soon as you start breathing at six cycles per minute, we see an increase in cardiovascular activity. So here's the big question. How long should I do that for? And I, and I suppose I'm thinking twofold here. I'm thinking of the the footballer who's about to go and play a big game, part of their pre-game routine. Maybe I'm thinking about the golfer who's about to hit a golf shot even. Um, but also I'm thinking about general health and well-being on a day-to-day basis. Um, I don't want to preempt what we're going to talk about um, when we unpack it, your, your paper, but... Um, um, yeah, how, how long should I be looking at breathing uh, at six cycles per minute? And again, this is a, a really good question. And I wouldn't <laughs> necessarily say that we have a, you know, solid answer right now. Um, okay. Having done kind of a case study intervention that's that's being written up at the moment, we used five minutes per day with athletes. Um, okay. And from a qualitative perspective, they fed back that they've definitely felt more relaxed it improved their sleep and um, they were using it in lots of different parts of their life so not just like you were saying before a self-paced event in sport like a penalty kick or a putt or something like that and um, they were also using it for presentations at university um, and things like that so in essence it's very difficult to say how long we should be doing this at the moment um the one thing that I can tell you is when we're doing a period of slow paced breathing, we often see results dissipate once we've kind of finished slow paced breathing. So if you're doing it for five minutes, we do see that um, parasympathetic activity tends to drop off once we've ceased doing the slow paced breathing. Um, 
we do know that um, there are kind of slightly higher levels afterwards and slightly higher levels across um, like an intervention over time. Um, but there is a, a little bit of drop off in comparison to when you're actually doing slow paced breathing. And again, this is definitely something that is in the pipeline, um, hopefully for future research around, you know, how long should we do, be doing this for? How much should we be prescribing this for athletes in terms of actually seeing effects? Um, but I think you've given some really great examples in terms of what I would advise athletes, like using it before something that's quite important. So whether that's going out onto the field or a self-paced event, or actually really thinking about using it for a well-being tool. So using it in conjunction with mindfulness, for example, or using it before sleep um, to help improve sleep quality. So there's lots of applications. Um, typically, I would say um, five minutes would be really good to fit into a very busy athlete schedule. Um, yeah. But yeah, I can't necessarily give a, a, a direct how long, how often no. just yet. So there could be an element of trial and error um, and a lot of individual differences here and um, a lot of contextual differences is kind of what I'm I'm thinking here. Absolutely. And I think that that in a nutshell reflects heart rate variability as a measurement. Okay. It is hugely individual. Yeah. Um, we all have different uh, levels of heart rate variability we all have different levels of normal um so actually it, it is something that is very individualized and that is is something that's really important I, I don't know if you can point to any research but do you think belief in this kind of thing actually can influence its impact as well i'm probably asking you for a bit of a subjective opinion here but um because i suppose from my own experience when i competed out in the golf course and i had visited some sports psychologists who talked about um, uh, breathing now admittedly they haven't spoken about uh, heart rate variability and I I have actually used HRV um, I don't have your knowledge of it but I've, I've used it in a very casual manner and I think one of the challenges I found is I'm going to use the term belief belief in the power of breathing to influence psychological processes to then influence performance I do think sometimes that we work through narrative and meaning in sports psychology is in changing goal orientations to change the meaning of the performance you know we're being task oriented rather than outcome oriented and 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 things like that um where I was just asking someone to to breathe doesn't necessarily change that narrative and change that 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 meaning so do do you think that if hrv's impact can be mediated by someone's actual belief in changing breathing can change my performance and i think that's a a really good question because ultimately any intervention that you give an athlete there has to be some element of belief for them to to kind of hopefully have the the impact that you want it to have um I think that's why psychophysiology as an area is so brilliant with athletes because you can be like, hey, we put this heart rate monitor on you and we've got all of this lovely data. This is what happened when you were performing badly, for example. This is what happened when you said that you were feeling stressed. And there's almost those kind of numbers to almost back it up if you like yeah. obviously there's a there's a level of interpretation that needs to happen there but with an athlete they have numbers coming at them from every other element of their life yeah um so how much did you lift today oh um, this is how much recovery you need and all of these sorts of things um and i think it's sometimes quite nice for them to have this evidence um and in terms of we actually hopefully very soon we have a case study coming out um where we worked with an athlete myself and some colleagues and um, we did slow paced breathing with them um, they used an app on their phone um, just to, to use it. And um, I think in the first instance, they were perhaps a little skeptical. They weren't really sure. They couldn't necessarily see the impact straight away. Um, but one of the quotes um, that we got from a post kind of intervention interview was that when they were about to perform, they were doing their breathing and they said, oh, my hands were less wet um so actually they kind of had this oh like my physiology has changed as a result of using 
this breathing technique and I'm going to use this technique in this situation that they've told me works. Um, and yeah, it was really nice to have that kind of, you know, realization of, oh, this actually is having an effect on my physiology. And, and I, I do feel more ready to compete now as a result of using it. Um, but I think like with anything, athlete buy-in is really crucial to any intervention. Um, I think the, one of the cool things about using slow paced breathing and its impact on heart rate variability is we definitely know that it has an impact and you can show an athlete that it has an impact. Um, it's whether they buy into it and they have that adherence, obviously. Let's unpack your paper. What were your findings? Um, because I, I, I know you, you examined past research papers and their findings uh, on heart rate variability, on you know, sports psychological processes such as stress and anxiety and so on and so forth. So would, would you like to, in no particular order, would you like to unpack that a little bit? What, what historically has been found? Yeah, so I think one of the things that I kind of almost have to like preface this uh, answer with is across the board of literature that we reviewed, um, there was usually limited theory. So actually the underpinning of what they were doing perhaps wasn't there. Um, okay. The methodologies were lacking. Heart rate variability is a super sensitive measure. Um, so actually there's a huge amount of work that you have to put in before you can actually say that you've measured what you've measured. Um, and actually a lot of the interpretations of particular measurements uh, were perhaps incorrect. So I think we all almost have to kind of preface that that question with hey there's a lot more work to be done in this particular area um before we can really understand what we found from it um yeah. but in terms of perhaps some highlights in terms of of some themes that did reoccur mm. um anxiety for example so, so like pre-competitive anxiety um mm -hmm. for the most part uh, papers reported a, a decrease in uh, parasympathetic activity, so decrease in heart rate variability prior to um, competitive events when compared to perhaps a training event or a, a less important competition. Um, so we know from that it, that's quite interesting because that's obviously a really important point to be able to then do an intervention to perhaps you know um, improve performance or improve how they're feeling before performance. Yeah. Similarly with stress, um, in some cases, there were decreases in heart rate variability in stressful scenarios, whether that was, um, again, lead up to competition or perhaps in other scenarios like pain. So the onset of a stressor, um, we did see reductions in um, parasympathetic activity. Um, again, with mixed results, um, I'm trying to be as scientific as possible here. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so there's definitely um, when we are faced with demand in a sport and exercise setting, um, there's often a decrease in parasympathetic activity associated with that, um, which is what we would expect in terms of, of the measure itself. Um, we also have some really interesting findings um, with cognitive performance. And this is something that's actually really well researched in other areas of, of psychology. Um, so actually, heart rate variability is a really key indicator of executive function um, of a particular type of, of performance in terms of cognitive performance. So that's linked to stuff like decision making, emotional control, all of these sorts of things are actually really important when we're working in a, in a sport and exercise setting. Attention? Yeah, attentional control okay. too. Okay. And so would you say, again, I'm probably asking you to give me uh, a, an, an opinion here then. If, if I'm just thinking of a, a specific example for coaches that actually, so I, I, I've, I'm going to, I'm going to preface this by saying I've been in environments, um, high performance environments where coaches have asked me or had a conversation with me about player engagement uh, to improve learning. How can I uh, improve my ability to engage players, let's say in a team meeting, for example, in order to improve learning capacity? 
And so what I'm thinking here is you're speaking, if there's a link between HRV, heart rate variability and cognitive function, particularly something like attention, and we know that attentional processes heavily mediate learning, um, having players, having players, people involved in slow paced breathing at the beginning of a, me a meeting, I wonder if something like that could actually improve their capacity to learn. Yeah, I mean that is definitely something that that might have an have an effect. Yeah. Um, I think it's almost thinking about like readiness to learn as yes. well. So actually, would slow paced breathing put us in the right state? Yes. Again, we'd have to play around with time there as well because, say, for example, you're doing ten minutes of slow paced breathing before a meeting, you might be falling asleep because it's quite relaxing. Um, so it might even be that you do a really short version of that um and i don't know if you've seen um i think it was the the french rugby team they actually got together after winning a particular point and they do this kind of like group breath yes. together uh, again i'm not 100 percent sure of the science behind that i haven't necessarily seen anything around kind of group breathing um but it might be just like a refocusing tool or um, something that can really, you know, channel and change your physiology in, in a moment to help switch yourself on or um, perhaps get you ready for, for a meeting. But I love what you said there because you, you, you've you kind of said to me, Dan, stop talking about performance and learning and start thinking about, as for example, mental state. So you could potentially, as you said, utilize something like HRV at the beginning of a meeting in a very short way because we don't want them to necessarily relax. We want them to be alert. We want them to be activated. But that breathing might help get them into a mental state that is conducive to learning, potentially. Something that could be researched, maybe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, interesting. Sorry, but, but away from sport, there's strong evidence that heart rate variability has a, a link to executive functioning yes yeah so there's there's quite a few um like reviews and meta-analysis on that mm -hmm. um that heart rate variability particularly resting levels of heart rate variability um is associated to better executive function okay. so again that could link quite nicely to you know how does somebody perform prior to a task that maybe requires quite a lot of cognitive demand yeah um Again, we have issues in sport, particularly because as soon as we start running around, <laughs> sympathetic activity is all over the show. And, you know, that's really obviously going to skew any kind of influence of the parasympathetic activity. However, doing stuff prior to something that requires high levels of executive function um, is certainly uh, definitely going to be a useful exercise in sport. So, so for example, self-paced self sport um, we'd be looking at utilising it prior to, for example, hitting a shot in golf. In team sports where there is, uh, in team invasion sports where there's a lot of running around, it's pre-game, pre half-time and so on and so forth. Yeah, for sure. Or any kind of shift in momentum. So something like a team sport where the ball's down the other end, like netball, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that actually could be a period where you're resetting and, and using slow-paced breathing. Um, and also like other sports. So we've done, um, I've done a little bit of research in shooting. Um, so obviously anything like that, where you're really having to do a controlled fine motor movement, and actually there's not a lot of movement involved, um, is something that would be really beneficial too. Do you, so do you actually think that, I mean, I do a lot of work in the world of football, soccer, and I think. Um, that world can be a little bit obsessed with it's such a quick game it works in seconds forgetting that the brain and the nervous system essentially function in milliseconds and as you've quite rightly said you've referred to netball I would also talk about football soccer the ball's up the other end of the pitch maybe I'm a defender do you think that defender could do a couple of cycles of um uh, five you know let's call it five seconds in five seconds out uh breathing and that could actually potentially impact their attentional processes and decision making and so on and so forth in terms of what we know for from the fact that slow paced breathing increases parasympathetic activity and that's directly linked to better executive function yeah. then i would say yeah. yes um obviously the influence of movement and fatigue perhaps if they've literally just been sprinting then that obviously might have an yeah. effect um 
but as uh, you know in terms of the the physiology behind it I definitely think that it would have an impact and again we've got this psychophysiology element it allows the player to perhaps mentally reset um but they're also getting a physiological benefit from it as well but that's important emma isn't it i mean you wouldn't necessarily i say you wouldn't necessarily you might do but you wouldn't necessarily do that with a a a young 12 year old participant in let's say football soccer um who is playing the sport for participation purposes or or, or is learning the game uh, and so subsequently has a certain cognitive load on their executive functions. However, for an expert uh, developing an elite or elite adult level um, footballer, soccer player, then I don't think one should underestimate the building that into somebody's game you know you could practice that in 11 v 11 training sessions um and and that can be important especially when you go a goal down and maybe you're a defender who's just made a mistake and the goal's going in because of you and maybe there's kind of a lot of an emotional load that you're experiencing um something like that uh, a minute of hrv if you have the potential maybe the goal's just gone in and the opposition are celebrating and that's that's actually something that practically the defender can do rather than ruminating in that moment that is classic action orientation in my opinion yeah absolutely and i think it's it's one thing that's so good about breathing is it's free it's easy to use you can use it anywhere um and as long as you've practiced getting to that six cycles per minute outside of a competitive environment then there's no reason why you can't call upon it in those situations where you need it Um, and being educated about the the benefits of it um you know i'm going to use this and i know that it's going to have a physiological effect as well as a psychological effect so um You spoke earlier that you came to um, psychophysiology through um, your your interest in challenge and threat states. Um, So what's the relationship there? How's HRV related to challenge and threat? So, yeah, there's unfortunately not a massive amount of research. um, Okay in challenge and threat with regards to heart rate variability because heart rate variability isn't one of the traditional cardiac markers um, that's used in challenge and threat research. Um, So there's definitely a scope there to to use it alongside the the theory of challenge and threat. Um, We do see in a couple of studies, so um, I think it was around two studies that we reported in the paper, that when athletes are in a threatened state, it's often linked to a reduction in heart rate variability, um, which is, again, what we'd expect in terms of the theory and physiological response. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, not a huge amount uh, has been done in terms of linking heart rate variability to challenge and threat, but it's there's certainly scope. It feels, the gut feeling is there's a relationship there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And look, your paper is is littered with uh, links between certain psychological concepts and constructs and HRV, such as pain, personality traits, motivation, mood, flow, self-efficacy and confidence, uh, and, and recognising there might not be a history of strong research here. I mean, were there any nuggets in there related to any of those concepts or constructs? So I think that the main thing to take away from the paper with regards to all of these different areas um, is we actually created a a table towards the end of the paper um, for practitioners and researchers who are wanting to use heart rate variability in um, sport and exercise psychology. So areas that actually make sense in terms of the theory. So stuff like anxiety, stuff like stress, um, pain, injury, emotion regulation, cognitive performance. So actually things that we have evidence and theory to suggest that they do have a link with heart rate mm. variability. Um, and we've suggested markers that should be taken and perhaps the, the theory that would actually underpin that hypothesis if they were wanting to test it. Um, I think there's kind of two elements to using heart rate variability. You've got the research side. So obviously the paper is heavily kind of aimed towards the research side where we talk about gold standards for research methodology etc etc um 
But there's also the fact that practitioners need to use it and it needs to be accessible. But they also want to know that the numbers that they're getting are going to be reasonably reliable. So they're actually telling them something that's of use. Um, so I think uh, a nice example of how practitioners can maybe use this and perhaps not get so bogged down in like what variables you should use in X, Y, Z um, is using something simple like a polar heart rate monitor um, and the Elite HRV app. I don't know if you've heard okay. of that one, um, but it's a free app and polar heart rate monitors are pretty accessible. Most sports clubs will, mm -hmm. will have some um, and they're reasonably cheap and affordable to, to buy. And that gives us... Um, reasonably reliable data um, from a practitioner's point of view and it's a free app that digitizes our heart rate on the screen it's got breathing built in um, so again that's something that I would recommend for anyone who's interested in kind of using this in, a, in an applied sense um, to kind of get their hands on that and, and have a little play around with that and the same for coaches yeah I would say so I don't think there's any harm in in using this um, from a coaching perspective. Obviously, I've kind of touched upon the fact that training science does make a brief appearance in the review. And again, I'm not a training scientist, but um, there's lots of apps out there. So like HRV for training is another popular one um, where athletes can be monitoring their heart rate variability over the course of a season, for example, but also measuring other subjective elements like fatigue, muscle soreness, tiredness, um, and things like that. So again, for a coach, that actually gives really valuable information. So you've got a player that's rocked up to training and they don't look themselves, they've not performed. And actually you go and have a look at their, their data that's been collected over the past couple of months. And actually you've seen a, a decrease in their baseline heart rate variability. Oh, actually I need to go and have a chat with them. Maybe they've got some other stuff going on and that they're, they're feeling a bit burnt out at the moment um, because we know that heart rate variability can be an indicator for overtraining, burnout, et cetera. Um, so again, I think there's, there's kind of definitely ways that coaches can use it from monitoring athletes, um, psychologically and physiologically, but also thinking about how can we get athletes using this in practice, like on a one-to-one -one basis. So actually what's happening to your heart rate variability when you're approaching a stressful situation, for example. And so if you're a performer, if you're a participant, if you're a player, um, leaning towards the research that you've done. I think you talked about a case study around, around you might experiment with five minutes a day, that, that cycle of six press. That, that's a good place to start. Do what feels comfortable uh, in terms of that, those cycle of breaths. And um, you could do that, what, in the afternoon, chill out after a morning uh, training, that type of thing? Yeah, so if you're if you're looking to take um, heart rate variability measurements on the daily, mm -hmm. uh, I would recommend taking it upon waking. Um, that's going to be okay. your most unaffected time to measure it. Okay. Um, so literally straight after you've woken up, um, take your morning measurement then, um, because heart rate variability is affected by a lot of things. So taking it at the end of the day is, is perhaps not going to give you uh, as accurate a reading. Um, so yeah, straight after you've woken up in the morning for a morning measurement, um, and then if you're using it in a session, perhaps, I would probably take a resting measure first. So actually, where are they at resting right now? Mm -hmm. Then put them in a situation that has demand. Mm -hmm. So um, whether that's a penalty shootout scenario or putting in golf, for example, and then look at the change. Okay. So actually, how does that number change and you could also look at talking about this kind of 3r approach so resting reactivity and recovery mm -hmm. you could also then measure um for a period of time after the event so actually how quickly does that athlete return to if at all basing uh, baseline levels um and that in itself is very interesting for sport because how do we bounce back from multiple demands um and actually can we put something in like oh i've just like made a mistake and the team scored I now need to like recover myself and get ready for the next demand because the ball is going to be coming back any minute um so I think yeah that's definitely to summarize take a morning measurement every day if you're wanting to look at this uh, longitudinally mm -hmm. um but if you're looking more kind of a one-to-one -one practitioner um let's look at a stressor for example I would take a resting measure take a measure during the stressor and take a measure after to see how the athletes react. And if you're not, for those listening in who 
sort of feel that, well, you know what, I'm not going to be as invested in terms of, uh, you know, longitudinal measures, but I kind of like the sound, as you said, Emma, this is free. I kind of like the sound of taking some breaths for a few minutes, five seconds in, five seconds out, four and a, four and a half, five and a half seconds. Um, yeah, just doing, just doing it every day, you know, people people might see some benefit there yeah absolutely and like we've kind of discussed already it's so easy and free to do um you know if for example you're kind of struggling with technology or access to that you could even just count um or like there's loads of stuff on youtube as well for different like breath cycles or even using the timer on your phone um to actually kind of do do this breathing um and again depending on when you want to do it it really depends on um, the application. So maybe you're feeling stressed and you want to do it to chill out. Um, you might want to use it before bed to enhance sleep quality. Um, you might have an important meeting at work that you want to use it for to make sure that you're feeling nice and ready before you go in. Um, so yeah, the application in terms of people just wanting to have a go at slow paced breathing is, is pretty much up to them. And so I've got one more question for you then. Um, with all that in mind, if, if, if an athlete goes away and utilizes this and doesn't necessarily go down the path of, of, of any kind of short or long-term measurement, but just uh, thinks about um, those cycles of, of breathing over the course of a few minutes or five minutes, could they actually int- could they do that alongside something like mental rehearsal or even, you know, affirmations in self-talk? Or is that creating uh, a split attention whereby it wouldn't necessarily help them or uh, produce any kind of positive effects do you think so i think with any kind of intervention practice we could think about layering this yep. so in in the first instance i would say let's get the breathing rate down without the need for a guide so an app for example so actually you're able to breathe at that specific pace in any situation um, and actually you know the pace that you need to breathe at to get those psychophysiological effects then i would say that's the point at which perhaps you could start to add that kind of cognitive side um so adding an affirmation or linking it to self-talk um, or something like that so yeah i think it's really important that the athlete is able to breathe at that rate autonomously without the need uh, for an app or something like that first and then yeah definitely adding kind of that more cognitive layer after interesting look i can't thank you enough for this and um you know i i do in my own consultancy practice recommend um breathing and and, and the cycles of of breathing and and so this has certainly put far more meat on the bone in terms of the science uh, and in terms of you know what the evidence uh, tells us out there and it seems like a really exciting area exciting area yet so simple in practice that you you do sort of uh, wonder why everybody wouldn't be utilizing it you know with that in mind emma i mean how can how can people uh follow you if you wish to be followed um on social media and maybe get in contact with you if if they're if they have any questions around this and um i I don't know if the the paper is public access um but how could they potentially find it online uh yeah so i'm on twitter so it's at emma underscore mosley so give me a follow i try and be active uh, as i can on there um, but i'm i'm pretty responsive on there so if people want to, to ask any questions about the paper or they need access to the paper um then that's fine feel free to contact me on on twitter brilliant fantastic emma thank you so much for your time today thank you dan thanks for having me well everybody i really enjoyed that podcast and i'd love to hear what you the listener thinks So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Psych Show. And if you do have any questions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.